you so much for coming. Uh, as you can imagine, as a speaker, the worst nightmare is to be standing here with no one in the audience. And it happens more often than you might think. So first of all, we are at the Embedded Systems Conference. And the problem is, I mean, we are the experts here in the world. You know, we are the Embedded Systems Designers. If I were to go around everyone in this conference and say, what is an embedded system? Everyone would give me a different answer. And if I were to say, is this an embedded system? Some people say yes, some people would say no. And this is something I've actually been thinking about quite a lot recently. Uh, in the past, say 20, well 15, 20 years ago, I would have thought of an embedded system as something that was behind a wall somewhere, doing something and I don't know. And a very good definition back then that somebody told me is an embedded system is one that you don't even know it's there until it stops working. <laughs> and that, that works for me for a long time. But more recently I've been really, you know, people say, oh, microwave, it's an embedded system. And I, I've been thinking about this. So this is called a centrifugal ball governor. Uh, two balls on the vertical post. It controls the speed of a steam engine. As the engine gets faster and faster, the balls swing, the balls are spinning around, they swing out due to centrifugal force. And that controls the fuel. This is a very clever technique. Uh, it doesn't matter if you keep on increasing the load on the steam engine, and so the, the steam engine starts to slow down, the balls will start to go down, release more fuel, speed up. Uh, so this is from the uh, first one was 1788 by James Watt. Uh, 1868, Carl Maxwell did uh, the first control systems analysis because they found that if you didn't get it just right, it would yeah, 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 be hunting. And so he analysed it mathematically and that's the beginning of control theory. I would say this is an embedded system. It's a control system. It's performing computation, it's doing it mechanically, but it's still performing a computation, it's controlling a larger system. There are, I was talking to Johnny Dunn earlier on, and he was saying that uh, he was doing some work in the nuclear power station, and there were some special switches, mechanical switches, that they had four states, three positions, four states. So, center off, you turn it left and back to the center, and it's now in a different state, you turn it right and back to the center, and it, it's you've got memory. It's a state machine. It's a mechanical switch. Now, the outside is not the embedded system, but the switch behind the panel. And it's a simple, it's a state machine. It's a mechanical switch. Now, that's an embedded system to me. So, bearing that in mind, a lot of people would say, oh, the, the dishwasher and the microwave, those are embedded systems. And I would say, no, they're not. The dishwasher is a dishwasher. Inside that dishwasher is a control system. It could be clockwork. It could be microcontroller base. That's the embedded system. The microwave is just the microwave. The embedded system is the control system inside. A smartphone. Now, some people just immediately say smartphone is an embedded system. Or it's not. To me, it's a phone. But it contains lots and lots and lots of embedded systems. If I take that smartphone and I mount it in the wall and use it to control the house, the heating systems, then it becomes an embedded system. How about the uh, tower computer down here? Is that an embedded system or is it not an embedded system? Okay, put your hands up if it's an embedded system. Put your hands up if it's not an embedded system. Okay. <laughs> Just to make sure. Something... <laughs> now, the way it is presented there, I would say it's a tower computer that contains many embedded systems. The hard disk drive has got a microcontroller, the graphics of the GPU is a, an embedded system, and so forth. Of course, if I were to take that tower computer <laughs> and put it in the knee joint of a giant robot, where it controls it, then it's an embedded system. But this was, I find this actually very clarifying for me. Uh, it took me a long time to actually work this out. But I feel this is a pretty good definition myself. I would, obviously. This is one of my favourite quotes. Inventions have long since, long since reached their limit. This is from 98 AD. I, 
the mind boggles, of course. <laughs> the interesting thing, uh, so hindsight, though, the only exact science, looking backwards and telling the way it should have been. <laughs> yeah. Back in around uh, 50 AD, a Greek mathematician scientist called Hero of Alexandria uh, had the first documented steam engine. Very simple, it's a ball that you fill with water and hang from a thread, you heat it with fire underneath and it spins around. Yeah. If they had taken that idea from being a kid's toy and extrapolated it, can you imagine the Roman Empire with steam engines charging around to take the, the troops? <laughs> uh, the world would be somewhat different. Uh, in England in the 1850s, Charles Babbage yeah. was busily creating, he had the idea for mechanical computers, the analytical engine. Uh, he never finished it, and a lot of people say that's because you couldn't do it. The, math, the material science, the engineering wasn't sophisticated enough. There's a guy called Joel Shirkin who wrote a book, uh, Engines of the Mind, I think. And he said the real reason was that Charles Babbage was a tinkerer. He sent something off to the machine shop, it came back and he looked at it and said, I can do it better than that. And he redesigned it, sent it off again, and it came and I can do better than that. So the reason he never finished is that he was always dinking around. But other people did actually build working differential engines and potentially they could have built a, 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 a real... It, this was a real computer. By our terms, it had memory, it made decisions. Uh, and, well, can we make mechanical computers? This is called the Z1. Uh, this is a binary floating point mechanical computer that was fully operational in 1938 in Berlin, created by a guy called Konrad Zuse. Uh, the thing at the front is a motor. Uh, it was a one hertz clock. He had the idea of separating uh, the memory from the arithmetic unit. He had no clue about Babbage. He had no clue about uh, Boolean algebra. He invented the whole thing from scratch, and it worked. Now, with a one hertz clock, if you have a smartphone today with a one gigahertz clock, performing a billion operations a second, if you were to do the same thing with this, uh, you could also hand crank it at one hertz. It would take you 37 uh, years, approximately, to, uh, to do the same amount of work as one second on a smartphone. But still, mechanical computers were uh, possibility. When the uh, telephone was invented, uh, close to, around the same time we had the relay, which was then used to create switching networks for uh, the telephone system. Uh, and of course, the chief engineer of the British Post Office, now the Post Office in England, was in charge of the telephones. Uh, but obviously, he uh, was a man with a great vision for the future. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but again, they had relays in the late 1800s. They didn't know about computers. If I were to go back to the 1880s or so, I could build a fully working computer out of relays. How would that change the world? It'd be quite phenomenal, really. And I actually have a friend, believe it or not, who is making a, an optical, a light computer, using only the technology that was available in 1900. Uh, and he, he's already got a ring counter working, a D-type flip-flop, just using elements that were available back in 1900. He's intended to build an entire computer this way. Uh, the light bulb. Who invented the first light bulb? Edison. Uh, Edison, Thomas Edison, a lot of people say, uh, no. Yeah, right. uh, fortunately, the Americans are really good at movies, and when they made the movie about Thomas Edison, they had him inventing the first light bulb in 1879. In fact, a guy called jo uh, Joseph Swan demonstrated the light bulb exactly the same a year before in England. But when Edison unveiled his light bulb in 1879, Swan, over in England or Scotland, uh, had lit up an entire town. Unfortunately, Swan did not have the uh, Hollywood behind him. <laughs> in 1883, one of Edison's workers discovered uh, William Hammer discovered a strange effect that if you put a metal plate inside the light bulb with a wire coming to the outside, when he turned the bulb on, it could detect electricity flowing. And he told Edison, and Edison was like, oh, who cares? Yeah. It wouldn't help light the room. 
this was 1893. It wasn't until 1904, 20 years later, 21 years later, that a guy called John Ambrose Fleming in England took this and made a, a diode, a vacuum tube diode, something that can conduct electricity in only one direction. It sounds simple, it's not. If you put your fingers in the electric socket in the wall, you will find that you conduct electricity in both directions. <laughs> 1907, uh, the American scientist, the leader Forrest, added a third terminal and made a triode, a, a, a vacuum tube switch. With those, we could make computers. Also, in 1907, a guy called H.R. Round wrote a letter to an electronics magazine in America saying that he discovered a weird effect with carborundum. If he applied electricity, he was getting a weird glow. And it was actually the precursor to LEDs, but no one followed it up. So the first LED didn't come until 1951. But we could have had those a lot earlier. Uh, in 1925, a guy called Dr. L uh, Lillianfield uh, presented a paper that described the functioning of the field effect transistor. The, the theoretical functioning. Never actually built it, just thought this would work. No one paid any attention, so we didn't get transistors until 1947, but we could have had transistors an awful lot earlier. So, that's just a bit of, you know, what, what if, what would have happened? You are here. We're going to be talking about the way embedded systems might develop in the future, but as this quote says, if you can't remember the past, you're condemned to repeat it. So I thought, a lot of people, like my mother, will say, well, you know, what's technology going to be like in 20 years' time? Who knows? <laughs> if you'd asked me what technology would be like now, 20 years ago, I wouldn't have predicted anything like we have today. Let's look at that a little bit. A hundred years ago, when my dad was born, well, he was, we were having a birthday party for him next year, he was born in 1915, uh, and he's not with us now, but we're still having a birthday party because he would have enjoyed it. So. But a hundred years ago, we see this big room with people performing calculations, pencil and paper, and mechanical calculators. The people used to be called computers because they were performing the computations. And this was a hundred years ago. The first radio broadcast didn't come till 1920. So when my dad was born, I, I always had this idea that, well, they didn't have television. But I could imagine my dad as a little boy sitting around the radio with his parents. They didn't have a radio. I don't even know if they had electricity, to be honest with you. When we came to the uh, beginning of the Second World War, this was our best early warning system in England. Big concrete acoustic mirrors with a microphone in the middle and a man with headphones. And if the bombers were coming over from Germany, he was, mm, ran, got the telephone. <laughs> bombers coming. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds silly, but you could detect bombers 24 miles away with a, a network of these. But uh, radar was discovered in 1935, the very rudimentary sort. But it was only just beginning pulse radar around the beginning of the war. Of course, by the end of the war, we weren't using these anymore, but they're still littered around England. Uh, and it's not that far ago. Again, you know, you've got iPads and things now, but this is not far ago. Of course, if you're only 20 years old, it seems like a million years ago, but to me, it's not that far. Televisions, I mean, there's a whole, we could do an entire talk about televisions. The reason I picked 1963, roughly on this chart is I was six years old and this was the year the first year that the British science fiction series Doctor Who was broadcast it was November Saturday and it was the first program as a six-year-old I'd ever heard with the electronic music because before that the BBC had full orchestras playing music and they had a new electronic lab and they made this electronic theme song the dum -de dum -de dum -de dum it was scary just the music was scary I watched that first program from behind the sofa. <laughs> and I still remember the program. Uh, if these days you turn on the television, it's there. In those days you turn it on and the picture grew from the middle to the outside. And most of the time, as a kid when it did, there was nothing there anyway, because the television, we only had two channels in England. And they only broadcast, they started broadcasting at four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, 10 o'clock at night, they did a news program 
I was in bed by then. Uh, and then they played the national anthem, and all the adults stood up and listened to the national anthem, and then they went to bed. <laughs> Times have changed somewhat. This is the way I remember the telephone from when I was young. We had one phone in the house, and we were lucky, a lot of people didn't. So a lot of people had to use pay phones, and it was wired into the wall. The first time you could actually make a phone call from England to America, or vice versa, or Canada, was 1970, 1971. Before that, when I was a little lad, as it came close to Christmas, my parents wanted to call my dad's brothers and sisters in Canada. Um, you didn't just pick up the phone. What you did was my aunt would come down to our house. My aunt and my mother would get on the phone and call the operator. They'd say they wanted to make an international call, so the operator would call the international operator in London. The international operator in London would call the international operator in Canada. The international operator in Canada would call the local operator in Edmonton. The local operator would call my aunt, and if she wasn't there, there was no voicemail. <laughs> like, tough. And if she was there, this wasn't the phone call. This was the one to say, we'll call you on Friday. Get everyone there. <laughs> so all the aunts and uncles came together, and all of us came together. And this phone was at the bottom of the stairs in a very narrow hall, and we were like this. And we got the call through, and it was like, hello, hello, happy Christmas. Put it down, because it was so expensive. <laughs> Total waste of time. 1971, the first microprocessor, the 4004. Uh, if only they'd realised what the changes were going to be. Uh, and again, we could talk about the history of this. I'm sure you've all heard about it a thousand times. 1973, the first cell phone call. Dr. Martin Cooper, uh, older now and much younger then, uh, when he made the call. Uh, and everyone has heard the story about uh, the guy at AT&T had told Marty Cooper that Motorola could never make a cell phone. They're in a competition to do the first thing. And so, of course, with a cell phone, you have to have a radio tower. So Motorola built a radio tower in New York. And he tested it first, but then he made the first call and he made it to the guy at at and and said, yeah, guess what I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> now, I was talking to Martin Cooper and he said that the less known story, he said, first of all, he stood there like this talking to his phone. Uh, and people in the street are like backing away from him. They, they, they don't say, oh, that's cool technology. They thought he was insane. They thought he was talking to a plastic brick. <laughs> And the other story is the second phone call, after he'd done this one, he thought he'd call his mother. And so he called his mother and he wasn't thinking, so he was like just walking around. He walked into the street and he almost got run over. <laughs> so the story of the telephone could have been that the second phone call, someone got killed and that cell phones are very dangerous. <laughs> okay, this is the uh, late 1970s. The reason I chose this is, this is, when I, this is what I used when I was at college. We wrote our programs on punch cards and paper tapes using these teletype terminals. Uh, and we were lucky, because uh, we also used analog computers. A couple of years before this, all they had was analog computers. Um, and again, if, I think that some people in this audience would say, yeah, I remember that. And there's younger people who go, no, you can't be that old. But this is the way it was. And it's, this is, you know, when I was in my 20s, uh, and also, at that time when I was a student in a popular electronics magazine in England, there, there, there were lots of adverts. There was an advert for a computer based on a microprocessor. And it was a single board computer. It had 1K of RAM and 1K of ROM, a hex keypad, and some 7 segment displays. And I drooled over the magazine. It was soggy with my drool. And I couldn't afford it. It was so far out of my scope. Now you can get a wristwatch in a box of cornflakes that has more computing power by far than that. And they throw them away. But in those days, I never dreamt I would have a computer. Has anyone seen Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome? Mad Max. Yeah. Yeah. There's a scene in Beyond the Thunderdome where he goes to a cafe, uh, well, to a town, and they say, you've got to hand your weapons over. And he pulls out his gun and puts it on the counter, and he pulls another gun and puts it on the counter, and pulls a knife. And <laughs> and the, the weapons pile up. That's me going through the airport security. Here's one computer. They say, put your notepad computer in the plastic tray. Well, there's the first one. There's the second one. Here's my iPad. Here's my Geiger counter. Here's my Nixie tube watch. <laughs> the electronic systems build up. 
20 years ago, 21 years ago, from the Zay, the first web browser. Now there was, the internet underneath that was there from before that, but this was the first time the public became aware that there was an internet. And I worked for a big electronics company in 1993. Uh, and I mean, this is a billion dollar company. And there was a huge debate inside, should we have a website? You know, does it make any sense? Does anyone care? No one had a clue what the internet was going to become and the internet of things and the cloud and all that stuff. 20 years ago, 21 years ago. I, it's not that far back now, it's getting closer. And it was a different world, only 20 years ago. This was not really the first camera, the cell phone with a camera, but the first, the first, the first commercial cell phone with a camera uh, was sold in the year 2000 in Japan. And when I first saw cell phones with cameras, which are very expensive, I thought, why? All I want is to make a call. Why would I want to take a picture with my cell phone? And what do I know about predicting the future? <laughs> These days we're so used to smartphones, we're so used to the iconic displays, we're so used to you turn the phone around and the picture turns around, it's got sensors in it, it's accelerometers, it knows which direction it's pointing in. It seems like these have been here forever. Steve Jobs announced this 2007, seven years ago. Before that, we'd never seen this sort of user interface. You know, touch screens, what? I cannot imagine living without an iPad. I mean, it's, you know, it's not life or death, of course, but I have it on my knee when I'm watching television. And, and if I'm watching the Travel Channel and it's about somebody who's moving to Brazil, I, I'm there with uh, Google Earth, I'm looking out on the street view, walking around. I, I can't imagine the world without it. The first one was 2010, four years ago. The world is changing very rapidly. So, what's going to happen in the future? Well, as you know, all the time people are telling us that the 8-bit microprocessor is dead. Yeah, it's all 32 bits. So I'm sure that in 10 years' time, the experts will still be telling us that the 8-bit microprocessor is dead. <laughs> and of course, we're going to have lots of interesting new products and embedded systems, and we'll be talking about these in a little while. In 20 years' time, the experts will be telling us that there will be some amazing products. I mean, amazing. 50 years, buying the bottom of products, of course, in 100 years, uh, we really have no idea about the technology, but we know what the experts will be telling us. <laughs> Meanwhile, the 8051 at the minute has sold something like 7 or 8 billion units and is still selling unbelievable the cores and things. We've now got 8051 cores that run at light speed. People keep on reinventing it because so many people have used it. And there's so much legacy code that no one knows who wrote it that we have to have 8051 to run it on, otherwise we're dead in the water. So, we are going to be talking in the rest of this presentation about things, the embedded technology, where it's going, the sort of things that we might uh, expect to see and so on. And of course we've got the internet of things, we've got the cloud, and all sorts of other cool stuff, like steampunk Adrian Lincoln. <laughs> but before that, we have to talk about something very serious, which is the possibility of a robot apocalypse. Back in 1984, there was the film Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'll be back. And he was, over and over again. <laughs> um, and it, it was Skynet taking over the world, artificial intelligence. You know, it, it's seen a long way in the future, if ever. And there's still a lot of people today who say, well, we cannot create an artificially aware system. You know, we can create artificial you know, AI systems, but they're not, they're not aware. Yes, that's true today, but things are getting a bit scary to me. If you, what we'll be looking at later on is some of the things that have been announced just in the last couple of months. And, and every time you see one of these announcements, you think, it's like another nail in the coffin. 
Of course, as someone said to me earlier on today, when you say the robot apocalypse, it depends on your point of view of the apocalypse part. <laughs> if you're the robot, <laughs> you may have a completely different uh, take on things. There's a really good book called Great Sky River by a guy called Gregory Benford. And this is about uh, 30,000, 40,000 years in the future. And humans have expanded throughout the galaxy, uh, star hopping. And as we approach the centre of the galaxy, we've clashed against mechanoid civilizations. Not just one, multiple ones. And first of all, they have, well, first of all, they don't like us. I mean, we're, it's like an intrinsic dislike of us because we're biological and messy and we leak and leave stains and smears. But also they have no recollection of where they came from. They just assume that mechanized, mechanized civilization is the only way to be where we come like what? And in fact, there's a really good story. Uh, you can uh, search this on the internet. It's a very short story by a guy called Terry Bisson uh, called The Made Out of Meat. And there's a, this, this is on YouTube, a, a little, someone's taken the story and you know, animated it with two robots. The, 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 in the story, we don't know the robots like this, the two mechanoids. And one of them's been on a deep space mission. And his job is to go out and search for intelligent life and to invite them to join the community. Of course, by intelligent life, they mean intelligent mechanoid life. So he comes back and his supervisor's going, so did you trace that signal? And he goes, well, yes. Did you invite them to join? He goes, <coughs> It's a good problem. He goes, what? He says, they're made out of meat. <laughs> he says, what do you mean, they're made out of meat? He says, they're made out of meat. He says, what about the radio signals? He says, well, the meat makes radio transmitters and uses them to send signals, but the signals originate with the meat. And the supervisor goes, you're, you want me to believe in thinking of meat? <laughs> <laughs> and eventually they decide to just scrub it out of the book and say there's no one there. <laughs> You remember the uh, Big Bang Theory, Sheldon Cooper? There's a guy who looks eerily like him on the right, Daniel Wilson, who's a professor at Carnegie of robotic science. And it, his predictions are pretty dire. Uh, he believes that there could be a robot apocalypse, and he wrote a book about it, just to make sure. And it's a fictional story, but the thing is that everything that he's got in the story is based on the current state of research and where things might go. Uh, and it really is a little bit, it makes you stop and think. So, if there is a robot apocalypse, how are we going to deal with it? I mean, it seems suspiciously quiet outside. For all we know, robots are stalking the corridors up and down. You know, we go out and we're going to be massacred. Fortunately, there is a way of preventing this. <laughs> the aluminum foil deflector beam, it uh, protects us against all forms of electromagnetic and psychotronic attacks. Uh, beware commercial products, don't buy these off eBay. Because sometimes they've got holes in, you know, so that you, they can get through. And certainly for myself, uh, I never travel without a roll, <laughs> just in case. So I'm assuming that you are all similarly protected. No? <laughs> oh dear. But fortunately, my friend Felipe at the back here never travels anywhere without 20 rolls of aluminum foil. <laughs> the people in America, as you can see at E-Life, take this very seriously. They don't go anywhere without their aluminum hats. So I thought we could have a competition while I carry on with the rest of the presentation to see who can make the best aluminum hat. Uh, and of course you might say, well no, I don't want to do this, but if I said the best hat gets 250 reels, maybe you would say, ah, I could be tempted. <laughs> so Felipe will hand out the aluminum foil. Uh, it'll give us something to do. If you get bored of me talking, you can uh, amuse yourself with the aluminum foil. <laughs> Interesting chart. This is just, you know, apropos of nothing at all. Uh, the, the elements in a human being. The green elements, uh, the five green elements, those are the most common elements in a human being. The blue, shown here, are the next most common elements. The yellow are trace elements. And the pink are uh, minimal trace elements. 
when you look at the total amount of elements, there's not that many of them, many of them that we need to make something that's magnificent to myself and my shirt. Here are the elements in the modern I see. Does it surprise anyone that there are more elements? These are the elements of a human being. These are the elements in the modern I see. There are far more elements to make the modern interface circuit than there are the kinds of main human being. Okay, we're going to be talking about some of the topics that we go through later on. So I'm just going to put a few highlights here. Something that really, really, really excites